I joined Landcope um, maybe a year and a half ago now, uh, and you know it's been a it's been a, a great experience so far. Um, there are, you know, I, I've been uh, working on computer security issues for for many many years, and uh, I, I spent many years looking at it from the perspective of um, intrusion detection and intrusion prevention, uh, and you know. The, the nature of the kinds of technical challenges that we face um, is changing, and I think that uh, NetFlow and an analysis gives us a, a, a new set of tools with which to address some of the problems that uh, you know, cannot necessarily be effectively addressed with signature-based IDS solutions. So um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a natural step for me to move from there to here, um, and it allows me to uh, you know, dig in uh, uh, to some of these problems from a, from a new direction that, that uh, you know, has a lot of promise. So um, one of the things that uh, we did shortly after I got here is we created the Stealth Watch Labs Intelligence Center. Uh, basically the idea is that we have a computer security research organization here at Landcope. Uh, we have a team of, we're, we're building a team of people who uh, look at attack activity, look at, um, uh, um, malware, um, attack tools, exploitation techniques, and think about our intrusion, uh, our anomaly detection capability, and, uh, and, and uh, you, you know, see where the gaps are and how they can improve it, and um, you know, how they can more effectively detect uh, activity that's happening out there. Uh, we, um, we uh, you know, of course, launched this website where we're showing you some of the threat intelligence that we're monitoring. Uh, and, and so what I want to do with this talk is, is Go over the threat landscape from our perspective. Uh, you know, what are the what are the who are the adversaries that are out there in general, and what are they doing, and what have we been doing over the past year uh, about these adversaries, and what do we plan to do over the f next year to address them? So, um, you know, from a big picture perspective, uh, computer security is a problem that has not been solved yet. Uh, uh, the, 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 the drumbeat of major breaches hasn't slowed. Uh, we, we continue to hear these stories of, of organizations that have a lot of sensitive data that are having to uh, you know, tell the world that that data has been stolen by somebody. Uh, and um, you know, many of these organizations are, are, are pretty competent when it comes to computer security. These aren't just uh, you know, people who have made stupid mistakes. It's a challenging problem. Um, uh, you know, I think that there are two reasons why um, we continue to see this 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 happening. Um, one reason is, uh, you know, it's it's um, it's it's when you have a very large, complicated organization, it's very difficult to ensure that every single I is being dotted and every single T is being crossed. Uh, when you look at this uh, a collection of breaches that have happened uh, this year, the the um, many of them are SQL injection attacks. Uh, SQL injection is very common as a theme here. That's a security vulnerability that we, we know uh, it's well understood. Um, we know how to find those vulnerabilities in software. We know how to fix them. We know how to uh, build uh, you know, WAFs and other uh, network equipment that will detect and, and block those, those attacks. Uh, but uh, the fact is that many organizations still have those vulnerabilities in their web infrastructure, and those vulnerabilities are still being targeted successfully. Uh, and it's simply because uh, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging, even though you, you know the vulnerability and you know how to mitigate it, it's challenging to put that mitigation into practice every single place that you, that you are responsible for. Uh, in addition, uh, attackers are successful at uh, staying one step ahead of, of the security solutions that we have, frankly. Um, so this, is, this slide is, is from a, a research uh, a, a paper that Semantic Research Labs published about a year ago. Um, that I found, I found very interesting. What they did is they, they, uh, they collected every binary file that passed the gateway of some of their customers, um, even though that binary file may not have been detected as being malicious at the time. So they, they did this for about four years and had a large corpus of binary files um, you, you know, that they had assessed as not being malicious at the time that they originally saw them. And then they took uh, their latest signatures and ran them retrospectively over that collection of binary files uh, in order to see if any of them had vulnerabilities or exploits that had subsequently come out or, or, and, and su had subsequently been covered. And they found uh, 18 zero-day vulnerabilities that had been exploited within this uh, collection of files, uh, 11 of which were not known to have been exploited in the wild before they were publicly disclosed prior to this research. Uh, they found that 
Um, they found samples of these attacks uh, up to 30 months uh, before they were publicly disclosed. Uh, and an average of 312 days uh, between uh, the first attack that they saw and actual public disclosure of the vulnerability. So um, it gives you an, an idea of, you know, with respect to sophisticated attackers, you know, how early they're able to get information that they can use to target networks and how long they're able to use that information before uh, anyone knows about the vulnerability, before there are patches available, before uh, security solutions like antivirus have signatures. Uh, and so uh, it gives you an idea of, of just how ahead of the game some of these adversaries are. Um, so this slide is from a talk that I did two weeks ago at, at Virus Bulletin. I did a talk on, on uh, the consequences of premature disclosure of security vulnerabilities um, uh, with, uh, with Holly Stewart from Microsoft. And uh, we, so we, we, we looked at a number of examples from history of security vulnerability disclosure and, and how things played out over time. Um, and one of the more interesting examples is Stuxnet. Uh, Stuxnet had a, a, a zero day, a couple of zero day vulnerabilities that it exploited. Uh, one of them um, uh, um, was, was disclosed when Stuxnet was first discovered, which was in July of 2010. And immediately, so you see the Stuxnet activity, which is this black line down at the bottom, and then you see this dotted line. That dotted line is other malware that was out there exploiting that vulnerability. So you see the public disclosure date of, of uh, the 14th of July, and within a few days, there are a bunch of other malware campaigns that have adopted that vulnerability and are targeting it because there was no patch available at the time. Um, the patch, uh, uh, you know, got released, um, uh, you know, a few a few weeks later. Um, but what's what's really striking about this, we now know, we didn't know it at the time. We know that Stuxnet was an example of essentially like international conflict in cyberspace. It was created by nation states in order to damage, uh, the, uh, you know, a, a nuclear or uranium refinement plant. Um, and 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 this this activity here, these these additional attacks that took place with this vulnerability. This is essentially collateral damage that occurred in the context of a conflict between nation states on the internet. So this is, this is the reality of the situation that we're dealing with today. This isn't a science fiction book. This is something that affected networks all over the world. Um, and and, and this, is the, this is the gravity of the challenge that we face, that we have um, nation state crafted attack activity that we have to contend with on our networks. Um, and, and we don't, uh, you know, as long as I've worked in this space, the reality keeps getting more significant. The consequences of compromising computer networks, the, the opportunities for attackers keep growing. The amount of money that financially motivated attackers can make keeps increasing. The um, opportunity for things like espionage and, and um, destruction of infrastructure uh, keep increasing, and people are taking advantage of that opportunity more and more. So, uh, you know, in spite of all the work that we've been doing over the past decade to improve computer security, uh, because the value of attacking systems keeps increasing, uh, the amount of attack activity is, is increasing with it, and, and, and it, it continues to become more sophisticated. So, who are the key threat actors from our perspective? Um, hacktivists, uh, um, you know, can cause people who are angry uh, and, and want to make a political statement have demonstrated that they can cause a significant amount of chaos on the internet. Um, organized crime, uh, people who have a financial motivation are running large botnets. Sometimes large networks of people are getting together to do these, um, uh, these crimes. Um, malicious insiders as well, um, that's a topic that, uh, um, so Forrester put out a study this week uh, that uh, uh, they did a survey of different IT security folks and 25% and of them indicated that malicious insiders were a significant source of attacks uh, in their environment. So um, it's, a, it's a serious issue. It's not an issue that I think IT security uh, as a profession understands how to deal with as well as we know how to deal with things like malware. Uh, but you know, that's changing and I'll talk about that in this talk. Uh, and, uh, and of course, nation states. It's a, it's a reality that we are facing nation state sponsored attack activity in our networks. So I want to I want to start with um, actually the second threat actor, organized crime. Um, and obviously, uh, there's a variety of different attacks that 
uh, those people engage in. They often engage in targeted attacks, but a lot of the attack, attack activity we associate with them is, is uh, malware. They're disseminating malware to try to infect as many machines as they can uh, and to steal credit card numbers and credentials and other things. Um, so uh, it's been about nine months since uh, Landcope launched the Slick Threat Feed, um, and, and it's, it's threat intelligence about command and control for a number of different botnets that are out there. Uh, I, we really want to hear feedback from those of you who have been working with Slick uh, regarding your experiences with it. How is it working out for you? Um, so far, I've heard some good feedback. People are finding that, that it is effective, that it's uh, telling them about things that they didn't know about. Um, it's, worth, it's worth asking ourselves why. Why is uh, threat intelligence uh, an effective tool? Um, and there's two reasons. I think it goes back to the two reasons that I talked about before. Uh, one is that it's very difficult to make sure that every I is dotted and every T is crossed. You're supposed to have AV on every computer in your environment, but you don't. Uh, and so looking at things from the network perspective can help you catch things that, that uh, you, you, you didn't uh, catch because of your desktop AV, um, because of gaps in, in, in compliance with the policy that you have. Uh, a second reason is that uh, attackers are good at staying one step ahead of uh, the security tools that we have. So attackers have gotten really good at, at, at encoding malware, packing malware, uh, so that AV won't detect it. Um, and a, one piece of malware will be packed in a variety of different ways, and they'll send out a huge number of different samples. And some AVs will catch some percentage of those samples, and other AVs will catch another percentage of those samples. But um, it's, it's unusual that, that everyone's catching everything out of the gate. Uh, but if you, if you can get the, uh, the, the they all, the, it's all essentially the same malware inside of the packing, and they all talk to the same command and control server. So you get the command and control server, and you look for connections that target it, and you can see um, you know, samples that are covered as well as samples that aren't covered and samples that no one has seen yet. So um, it's, a, it's an effective way to get protection out there quickly and, uh, and, and to, try to try to keep parity with the attack activity that's happening out there. So um, like I said, this is about nine months old, and, and our first step is to get some feedback from everyone about how uh, it's doing so far with what we have in there, but obviously uh, our goal is to continue to build upon this and, and to create new uh, threat intelligence sources that are valuable to you. Uh, one of the ideas that we have uh, is that it would be interesting to collect data about attack sources that you're seeing from your network's perspective. If we collect that from a lot of you and we could analyze it in, 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 our, in our lab, we might be able to correlate some things across uh, different customers to get new insight about attack, attack activity that's happening. So um, that's one of the ideas we're playing with. If you're interested, obviously, uh, that's sort of a, a, an alpha beta thing. The first thing I need to do is get some data, and then we can do some analysis and see if we learn interesting things. So uh, if you're interested in being an early part of that experiment, uh, please let me know, because I believe we can. I have a number of ideas for ways that we can find interesting uh, um, intelligence that way, but uh, you know, I need some networks who want to participate. Um, so in addition, uh, I, you might have seen the poster outside. Um, on Monday of this week, uh, uh, there was a conference here in Atlanta called VIS. It's an IEEE conference on visualizing data. And there, there's a workshop called the VizSec Workshop. The VizSec Workshop is specifically around visualizing security data. And so uh, we, um, we were excited about this because this really you know, is close to home from us, for us from a research standpoint. We collect a lot of data about networks and we try to visualize it so that uh, it's valuable to you. So we wanted to see what these researchers were working on. And uh, we wanted to, um, to present some of our own research. So, uh, what we did is we took a look at uh, malware command and control behavior. Uh, these charts are uh, uh, TCP and UDP ports that mal. So the chart on the on the left is malware. It's two. It's about 1.9 to 2 million malware samples that were uh, propagated between uh, 2010 and 2012. And uh, the TCP and UDP ports that that, it, you, that they, those malware samples used for command and control communications. Um, the, the colors represent how popular each port was. And they start you know, numbering from the top line across. Um, and so uh, the bottom of the chart shows you higher ports. Uh, the, so you can, and so on the, on the right, it's compared to data from our network. We actually pulled a top ports report out of StealthWatch um, and saved it as a CSV file and then used that file to generate the image. Um, 
uh, and it's, it's about a month's worth of traffic on our network. Um, and you can see some interesting distinctions. The malware uh, tends to prefer ports less than 10,000, uh, whereas you can see that ports below 10,000, there's a much less density of use of those ports on our network. Uh, and I, that's a strange uh, number for a barrier to exist, particularly in the natural um, uh, uh, or the legitimate traffic. I'm not sure uh, uh, exactly why uh, that occurred. Um, we know that, that we, we expected a difference to occur at uh, port 1024, and it did. Uh, there's a significant difference between the malware and the legitimate traffic um, in the well-known port range, but there's also a significant difference below port 10,000, which is interesting. Uh, so it's just an example of, of uh, some of the research that we're doing, um, I think it speaks to the power of anomaly detection because you can clearly see that there are distinctions here between uh, legitimate and malicious activity, and we hope to be able to leverage those observations in order to develop new signatures in the product. So, um, uh, you know, that poster is out there, and I'll be happy to go into more detail about that if, you, if you're interested. Um, so that's malware. Another issue that we see a lot of is DDoS. Um, DDoS is often associated with hacktivism, uh, but it's, it's become uh, also popular with, uh, with financially motivated criminals as well. A about a year ago, there was this FBI bulletin that went around about the use of DDoS as a diversion in financially motivated targeted attacks. So uh, these guys would launch a DDoS attack against the victim, and then while the security team is responding to that issue, uh, then they launch a targeted attack to exfiltrate data or steal money. Um, and uh, um, they're able to successfully uh, succeed with that attack because the SOC is not watching the IPS systems because they're too busy dealing with the DDoS scenario. Um, and when that bulletin came out, I said, well, that's an that's a, uh, isolated incident. Uh, but I, we keep hearing about it. I, there was a news story this morning from someone at Gartner talking about that. So, um, you know, clearly people are, are experiencing this, and there tends to be a bit of a bandwagoning effect with this computer crime where uh, somebody will do something, it'll be successful, word will get around, and other people will begin doing it as well. So, we're really seeing um, a lot of DDoS attack activity. Um, uh, you see a bunch of screenshots here. It's, it's getting um, easier and easier to pay someone to launch a DDoS attack for you. Um, if you spend a few minutes on Google searching for stressor or booter, you'll find people that will take your money and launch a DDoS attack against the victim of your choice. Um, and these people are competing with each other, so they're out uh, doing research to try to find traffic amplification vulnerabilities in different services in the internet so that um, you know, they send one packet to the service and the service sends 10,000 to the victim. Um, there are a bunch of things in the internet that behave that way. Uh, and so they're, they're out trying to find new ones and, and have the best booter or best stressor out there. Uh, and, and that's definitely, the, it's, it's, just, it's just so easy to do this um, that, that, it's, uh, that it's, the activity is, is increasing. And the other thing that, that's, ha so this, there's some statistics here from Prolexic. Year over year they saw a 33% increase in the number of attacks, but the, the bandwidth of, of the attacks went from four gigabits per second on average to 49 gigabits per second. So these attacks have become far more powerful. Um, and, and so this is a case where uh, you know, people's ability to handle that sort of a traffic flood in their infrastructure have not improved at the same rate over the course of a single year. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's unfortunately uh, the case that this stuff is, is advancing really quickly and becoming more popular. Um, a lot of you use StealthWatch to monitor your web infrastructure uh, for DDoS attack activity. Uh, it's a great way to sort of understand what's going on with your infrastructure, um, and it's an area where we are continuing to, to, to investigate. We're looking, at, um, we're looking at different DDoS toolkits in our lab. Uh, we released a new event in, uh, in, Stealth, in StealthWatch 6.4, uh, which detects application layer denial of service attacks. What we do is we look for a large number of connections coming from a particular source uh, that uh, don't have a lot of traffic going over them. So uh, that's, that's uh, 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 typical of, a, of an application layer DDoS attack where someone's um, pinning up sessions to your server, uh, but they've done something to prevent your server from actually completing that transaction and sending data down to you. Uh, so you've got all these sessions open, but there's no data being transmitted. Uh, so that's what that signature does. We're, we're looking at other, other things that we can p potentially detect, and um, we're also talking a lot about mitigation. So we're really interested in, in your thoughts about that subject. Um, 
The, uh, the third threat actor uh, that I wanted to talk about is insider threat. As I mentioned before, um, there is a significant amount of insider threat activity that happens. Uh, and I don't think that it's a subject that um, the IT security world really understands how to contend with. Um, uh, so these, these are uh, um, just two examples that happened recently. Uh, there was a major uh, incident at Vodafone where uh, millions of, of German customer records were stolen. Uh, and then I think last week this guy uh, uh, pled guilty uh, to, uh, he was emailing people's medical records to his personal email address from where he worked in South Carolina. Uh, with, and he was reselling those. Those are good for identity theft because you have a lot of information about the, uh, the person um, and so you can, you can claim to be them and get credit in their name, for example, and then go buy things and not pay. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, th these things do happen. Um, I, I don't know if uh, you folks have, have seen this book before. I'm sure many of you have. Um, this is my computer security book recommendation for 2013. Uh, it's uh, the CERT Guide to Insider Threats. Um, CERT uh, at Carnegie Mellon has been doing research on this subject for about 10 years. They've been looking, they have a huge uh, collection of real cases that have happened, and they've uh, meticulously looked at each one of those cases uh, to identify patterns uh, that, and, and uh, you know, actionable pieces of advice that people can uh, put into practice in their organization. So I, I don't know of a, a better resource on how to actually manage this problem uh, than, than this book. This book was just published last year. Uh, um, and one of the sort of key pieces of, of advice that they provide is that um, it, it, you can't see it as exclusively an IT problem. So people, people think about computer security and, and they think, well, IT is supposed to deal with that and, and they kind of make it a technical issue. But this is more complicated because in this case, the person who's committing the crime works for your company. And so it, it's, a, it's an HR issue, it's a management issue, it's a legal issue. Um, and all of those parts of the business need to be working together in order to be effective at dealing with it. It is not just a technical problem. Um, so uh, CERT does a good job of breaking down um, the incidents that have occurred over the past 10 years that, we, that, that, were, that were detected. Uh, and um, they, they talk about three primary categories of, of uh, insider threat. Uh, one is uh, IT sabotage. So that's, that's somebody who's... who's um, uh, deleting files or you know setting up a script to to uh, wipe out systems at a particular time um, uh, another is is fraud uh, that's someone who's stealing information that's potentially uh, uh, financially uh, valuable that they can resell like identity information or or uh, credit card numbers uh, and then the third is theft of intellectual property so someone who's stealing source code or or plans or maybe customer lists and stuff like that uh, and each one of these uh, three uh, categories has a particular profile in terms of uh, the sort of people who, who typically uh, uh, are in, commit that sort of crime and the context in which they commit it. Uh, so, um, you know, in the case of IT sabotage, it's often a, a technical person. Uh, um, you know, typically they, they did it uh, after regular business hours um, and, uh, um, you, you know, it's often uh, like after they've they've um, they've been terminated or or um, after they've left the company that the that the actual crime uh, takes place uh, or it's close to their the period of departure. Uh, uh, financial game is a totally different scenario. It's often someone who's like got a data entry job. Uh, maybe they're maybe they're um, uh, you know getting mail and they're they're inputting things from mail into a database uh, and they know that the things they're inputting are valuable and they begin sort of shoving them under their desk. Uh, uh, typically, it's done during regular business hours with the access that they legitimately have to do their job. Um, Business advantage is, is either you know, technical people or salespeople, often someone who feels uh, uh, the, that they personally own uh, some of their work product uh, and, they, um, and, and uh, you know, something has happened with the business. Maybe there was a merger or acquisition or um, uh, you know, management change and they, they, they're disgruntled and so they take their information and they leave. Uh, and, and what's interesting, there are, three, uh, there are two main points I want to make about this. The first is, is um, you know, in all three of these cases, uh, where these people were identified in the real world, they were identified because of logs. It's because there were audit trails that existed that investigators could look at to figure out who was responsible for these things. So, um, uh, you know, NetFlow is an important audit trail, 
that, that can be used uh, to, to analyze um, this stuff. The, the second point um, is that, at least in the case of IT sabotage and, and theft of intellectual property, a lot of these people are committing these crimes within a 60-day window, 30 days before they leave the company and 30 days after. Uh, and so that provides a window um, with which to, to investigate these things. And often these people are not, um, they're not detected because of some um, automated computer system that says, hey, there's an insider threat happening. They, they're detected because, um, because, uh, of, uh, because management knows that this person is disgruntled and, and, or management knows that something is going on and they become suspicious and that prompts an investigation. So it's a, it's a human driven uh, um, situation where IT security is receiving a request from HR that says this person is, is probably uh, worth investigating. And then using the audit trails that IT security has access to, they then go investigate and determine whether or not that's really an issue. Um, so uh, we've, we've um, so in 6.4, in StealthWatch, we added uh, some reports that, that make this process much easier to do with NetFlow. Um, we, we added these user reports where you can go in and you can put in someone's username and it will provide you all of the flows that that user is responsible for on your network um, as they moved around to different IP addresses. Uh, so that get, makes it very easy to get an understanding of, of what behavior that person is engaged in. It also uh, uh, ties up the alarms that have fired on the different IPs that they had while they had them. So if there was a suspect data loss alarm, for example, that fired, um, you'll see that, that alarm information in these reports. Uh, so it, 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 it's very quick and effective to, to go and do one of these user investigations where in the past, uh, it might have required a great deal of stitching of different logs from different sources together in order to figure this out. So the, the fourth uh, category of threat actor uh, that I wanted to talk about um, that I mentioned before is these uh, nation state uh, threat actors. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, frankly, this is one of the reasons that I came to LandCode because I think that NetFlow uh, provides uh, a, a really valuable tool with respect to this problem, and I see this as being one of the most important technical challenges in computer security today. Um, so the big news, I guess, in 2013 with respect to this was uh, the APT1 uh, report that Mandiant put out in February. Um, APT1 is a specific group uh, in, in, uh, in that, you know, Mandian alleges is in China, uh, that has, other people call them comment crew. There's a couple of different names for them, um, and they've, they've broken into uh, systems all over the world, and uh, particularly in the United States. Uh, there are other APT groups um, that people are tracking, so APT1 is a specific group. Um, and uh, when Mandy put out their report, they put out a lot of indicators of compromise. They put out IP addresses. No, they did not put out IP addresses, sorry. They put out domain names. They put out some SSL certificate information. Um, and uh, uh, the, there were a number of other organizations that at that time took a look at the data sets that they had and, and disclosed other details that they had access to that were not in Mandian's report. Uh, so we did the same thing. Uh, we took a look at the malware that we have um, and uh, we found a number of samples uh, that were not disclosed by any other organization and we found a few um, uh, domain names. And we're also really interested in IP addresses. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, we have information about what uh, some of these domain names were resolving to uh, back when they were actually active. So we disclosed a few IP addresses that we thought were valuable. Um, so the, the thing about threat intelligence like this uh, that differentiates it from the kind of things that we have in the slick feed are that the slick feed is, is real-time information. It's telling you about um, things that are actually active right now. Uh, whereas this stuff, the minute that these reports came out, all of this was burned, okay? These guys are, they shut all that stuff down. Um, they immediately started redirecting those domain names at different IPs. Um, so it, you can't use this stuff in real time to detect things on your network. Uh, but if you have historical information, then you can use this, this threat intelligence to see if you were infected in the past. Uh, and NetFlow's a great way to do that. We had a lot of customers who took the IP address ranges uh, that were disclosed, um, checked them against their, against their uh, system, and, and discovered incidents that, uh, that they did not know about in the past. We, I, I know of at least one customer that 
uh, um, ended up calling the FBI as a consequence of the investigation that this prompted. So um, th it's a, it, it, this goes back to what I was saying, that, that I think that, that a corpus of NetFlow that, uh, uh, in your network is a really valuable asset to have when you're investigating this sort of adversary. Um, so uh, the, the CSO of Mandiant um, uh, testified in Congress in March, about a month after uh, this report came out, um, and this quote comes from his congressional testimony, and I, I thought he sort of hit the nail on the head here. He said, every company in the United States that cares about security needs to be able to take a report like ours, digest the information in it, and look for intruders in your company. If you look at this report and you can't do that, you can't figure out how to find intruders in your company, that's probably job one. You need to be able to do that. And secondly, you need to be able to see over time how this affects you. We find that too many companies don't treat this as a business process. They treat it as something that engineers and technicians need to deal with. You need to realize that dealing with intruders is a fact of life in the business world and it needs to be a continuous business process. Um, so I, I, I really like, like that quote. I think it spells out very clearly um, the, 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 the nature of what needs to be done in order to protect organizations against these kinds of incidents and the way that things are changing. So I, I think that, that people have been very focused on um, preventing security incidents from occurring. Um, and whenever a security incident happens, um, you, know, you, you send in your incident response team to clean it up and then management says, okay, well, what do we need to do so this doesn't happen again? Uh, well, we, we need to invest in preventative technology. So we, we look at the perimeter and we see how we can better defend it. Um, and, and the problem is when you think about that semantic study, when you think about the idea that these guys know about vulnerabilities for, for you know, 30 months before they're publicly disclosed, um, the reality is that th there is no business process that you could put in place that is going to uh, prevent uh, an attacker with access to that sort of information from successfully getting through your perimeter defenses. There's, there's, you, there's no more money that you can invest in perimeter defenses that's gonna make you more effective against that sort of adversary. And so you have to ask yourself, you know, what do I need to do next? Um, and, and I think that the reality is that we need to take a, 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 a more complete view of the, the role that incident response plays in our computer security approach. Um, it's, it's, it's not just um, you know, this thing that you have to do where you, where you clean up uh, um, the incident and then, and then you move on. Um, the, the reality is that due to the persistent nature of these, these attackers, um, you, 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 once they're, once they're in your environment, they're, they're, they're interested in being in your environment for the long haul. And so um, if, you, if you find an infected computer, you can't just sort of uh, you know, re-image it and, and expect that everything's going to be fine. The fact is that that attacker is interested in your network and not just that system, that they have probably infected other computers in your environment. And they may have done it with totally different malware that's unrelated to the thing that you found. And so you've really got to start investigating these incidents and try to get a complete picture of everything that this person did in your environment. Um, the other thing is that as you do this analysis, you learn things. You learn uh, how they targeted your environment, where they targeted it from, what kind of malware they like to use, what the command and control protocol looks like, um, and, and, you can be, and what they're ultimately what they're after, what they're interested in, in targeting. And so you can sit back and think, first of all, um, these are all indicators that I could potentially look at my network and see if, if they show up in other places. So they may launch a different attack that, that has some different characteristics, but it might share some characteristics with the attack that, that you discovered. And so if you can find those connections, that might be a, a thread that you can pull on that enables you to see things that you couldn't find before. Um, in, in addition, it enables you to think about, um, you know, now I know what my adversary is trying to accomplish, I can put myself in his shoes and I can think about what steps he might take and I can try to anticipate his actions. Um, and so incident response becomes part of how you protect the environment. It's not just this thing that you do when you, after you lose, it's actually part of, of, of what you do to protect yourself. Um, you, you engage in, you detect these attacks, you respond, you analyze them, and you distill from that analysis new pieces of information that you can use to better protect yourself in the future. And so you're gonna hear uh, more about incident response uh, from uh, Larry Poneman uh, tomorrow morning. Um, we did uh, an interesting survey with them on the subject, but I, I think that 
that incident response is really the centerpiece of advanced threat defense. And organizations need to be thinking about what their capability to do it is, what tooling they have around it, um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, how, how, they're, how they're taking the lessons that they're learning from it and applying them back into uh, defending their networks. So, I, I, you know, the, the kill chain is, a, is a sort of a topic that's been beat to death, I think, over the past couple years, but it, it's a great subject because it speaks to the need to have a multi-dimensional view of attacker behavior. Um, for years, people have focused on perimeter and the, the exploitation step uh, with, with intrusion prevention and the initial infection step, detecting malware with, with AV. Um, and and that's, that's been the, the, the extent of the analysis that they've done of incidents against their environment. Um, it, if we know that, that, that attackers can evade the exploitation defenses that we have and evade the, the infection defenses that we have, then we've got to start looking at other aspects of their behavior. Um, and so understanding every step of the attacker's behavior and, and what controls you can put in place in each of those steps is a really important part of, of, of again, being able to defend yourself against a sophisticated adversary. Uh, but the other thing is that it's not just sort of um, all the steps that the attacker has taken, but those steps over time. And so that's where I get to a four-dimensional view of attacker behavior. We need to understand not just the things that they're doing, but when they did them and in what sequence and at what time. And we need the history of what happened in our networks in order to be able to reconstruct that, that, uh, that, that, uh, th that picture. So, um, you know, th again, this is why I'm excited about working with NetFlow and why I'm excited about being at Lanco because I think that, that solving this problem really well is the key to um, better defending networks against these kinds of attacks. Uh, so what, are, what is StealthWatch Labs going to be doing in 2014? Um, so one thing uh, hopefully you'll see from us is a lot more anomaly detection algorithms being added to the product. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, there, there hopefully will be an out-of-band content delivery uh, mechanism that is delivered in the product uh, at some point in 2014 that will enable us to, um, you know, update the, the detection and capability of the product without having to have you upgrade to a new version, which I know is uh, sometimes a politically difficult thing to do. Uh, we, um, we're refining the security model within the product uh, around the kill chain. Uh, so, you know, each one of the anomaly detection uh, events in our product relate to a stage of attacker behavior. Uh, and so we're going to organize things that way, and hopefully that will make um, the detection that we're giving you much clearer and more actionable. When it says, um, you know, I, I have a high concern about this host, it'll say, I have a high concern because it is engaged in behavior X that you should be worried about, and not simply, uh, hey, worry about this host. Um, we're, we're, as I mentioned, we're looking at new threat intelligence sources and feeds. Uh, and uh, again, I'm really interested in, in whether you guys are, or whether some of you are interested in working on a research basis uh, um, uh, in a data sharing uh, relationship, um, because I believe that there's a lot of value I can get out of that by you know, essentially using all of your networks as a dark net. Um, Enhanced tools for identifying and sharing indicators of compromise. So we have some really neat work we're, we're doing in the lab uh, around uh, creating a language that lets you describe um, uh, things that you're looking for in NetFlow, attack activity, for example, and enabling you to share those descriptions with each other. Uh, so that, so that, because you, you know, one of you may see a target and incident against your environment. You don't want to go tell everyone in the world that what you know, because the attacker will pivot. Uh, but you want to share information with your peers in your industry, because uh, we don't compete on that basis, right? So we want to enable you to do that better. Uh, and and so that's something that we're working on. Will hopefully be uh, released in 2014. Um, uh, we're looking at user behavior. I didn't mention this before. So I, as I said, we have those user um, behavioral reports. I can look at the behavior that a user has engaged in. And a, what, what's, so when, when you talk about these advanced attacks, often what happens is that the network is compromised, the attacker gets inside, and then the first thing he does is he goes after credentials. He goes after Active Directory or LTAP or wherever the passwords are stored. And he gets those passwords, um, and, and then he logs in over the VPN, right? Um, and now he's coming in and he's not using an exploit, he's not using malware, uh, and he's infecting machines in your environment as a legitimate user. Uh, Mandiant has a study that they did on, on um, APT incidents that they worked, and they said in 100% of the cases that they, that, that they investigate, the attackers go after legitimate credentials. And they also said, this was from, not from their most recent study, but from the one from a year beforehand, they said 54% of the hosts that were compromised had malware on them which means that 46% did not. They did not have malware. 
So if your like, approach to defending yourself against these attackers has to do with looking for malware and looking for exploits, you're missing a significant percentage of the kinds of stuff that's actually happening. And they know that. They know that you're focused on malware and exploits, and that's why they try to pivot out of that domain. And so um, this is why we're looking at user behavior. So, so you, you, know, you probably have tools that will tell you, like, hey, this guy usually logs in from this country, but today he logged in from a different country. And that can be effective in this context. I've seen it be effective. Um, you know, this guy usually logs in at, at 9 a.m., and today he logged in at 3 a.m. Um, again, uh, it's a simple thing, but I've seen it be effective. The problem is that those kinds of, of things are noisy. We have also see in the research world people looking at user behavior from a, what systems does this guy access or what web pages does he browse and can we come up with like a, a, a profile of the things he does every day when he gets on, uh, to work. And, and those things are interesting, but it, you know, the, the experiments never work out because people change their behavior all the time. Their job changes or uh, they decide to do something different today. Um, and, so, and so those behaviors break down. Uh, what we're interested in doing actually is trying to combine all three of those factors to produce something that can detect a compromised account activity with a low false positive rate. Uh, and so it's like you're, you're logged in from the wrong place and it's the wrong time and you're doing something different. Uh, that, that set of three circumstances is probably constrained enough that, um, uh, you know, that, that those anomalies are worth your time to investigate. So um, that's an area that we're, that we're looking at and we're really excited about what we can learn as we, as we pursue that. Um, the other thing is advanced malware focus. Um, I got a lot of interesting malware samples uh, um, related to, uh, you know, for example, some of the intelligence that we put out around APT1 um, and some of the, I have some samples of some of the other APT groups that are out there. Uh, and uh, we're going to put this stuff in the lab. Um, you know, in fact, uh, one of our threat researchers is working on that right now. Uh, and um, we're going to look at, at their command and control behavior and some of the other things that they do on the network and, and really uh, align some of the new anomaly detection events that we're putting out to detecting those kinds of samples. And so uh, if, you, um, if you have interesting malware samples that you would like us to include in that analysis, um, I, I would love to get a copy of them and we will certainly look at them and make sure that uh, um, you know, we consider their behavior in thinking about the new anomaly events that we create.